Syrian girl, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm honored to be here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited to get your insight on this. Interested, really. Um, okay. Syria, what in the heck? Um, this was a surprise. This was a surprise attack that that now, first of all, where is Assad and what have the rebels taken over? Well, there's been some propaganda that Assad is hiding in Moscow and that he's going to run away, a lot of stuff like that. In reality, he's actually in Damascus right now, who is photographed yesterday meeting the Iranian foreign minister. Um, so he's in Damascus, he's in the capital. So he, so he's not leaving. He's st he's sticking around for now because there were some reports that he had fled the country, that he's out of there, that Syria has completely fallen. Um, but he's still in Damascus. The and the go ahead. Apologize. Um, well, this That's is right. the kind of same similar propaganda we've been hearing for the last fourteen years. I mean, this is it feels like two thousand and twelve all over again. Where you know two thousand and twelve called. They want their propaganda back where we were told Assad is, is going to cut and run at any moment. He's not going away. Yeah. So who are these rebels and how much of this of the country have they taken at this point? So they've taken the second largest city of Syria, uh, which is Aleppo, uh, which is the second most populated city after Damascus. So it is quite uh, maybe not in area, but in location, they've taken a very important point. Um, who these rebels are, uh, they are led by a group called Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, which is previously called Jabhat al-Nusra, which is Al-Qaeda. And they are designated a terrorist group by the United States and the UK. And they are uh, linked to Al-Qaeda because their leader, Jolani, was one of the founding members of uh, Al-Qaeda um, in Iraq, which became uh, ISIS. And, uh, you know, he, they've tried to rebrand the thing. They've tried to clean it up. But the reality is it's, it's Al-Qaeda. Um, and uh, yeah. that's who it is. Yeah, at this point, I think they so, say, well, we're different now. We're, mo we're moderate. We're different. Right? <laughs> but, um, but it's Al-Qaeda. It's yeah. Al-Qaeda. And this was a group that... Yes. The, did the U.S. support this group? What, what sort of funding weapons or support have they received from the United States? Well, here's the thing. You know, during the uh, um, Clinton, Hillary Clinton email leaks, uh, Jake Sullivan told her that Al Qaeda is on our side in Syria in plain text. And that went everywhere. And it was highly embarrassing for the United States. So back then, they knew that they were backing Al Qaeda. Um, but in order to sort of uh, clean up the image, they designated Hayat Tahrir al-Sham as a terrorist organization sometime after those email ca leaks came out. Um, but they continued to support other rebel groups that were fighting alongside them and were supporting them. Um, this was Operation Timber Sycamore, which was a CIA operation to arm and train the Syrian quote-unquote rebels uh, to fight uh, Assad. Now, they couldn't call them democracy fighters. They couldn't call them uh, any sort of name that they would usually go with. So they called them the moderate rebels. And the, the whole notion of them being moderate, moderate what? They never tell you. Like, what they mean is moderate Islamists, right? They, they mean moderate head choppers. Um, and the thing is, with the CIA program and why it was eventually shut down, is because it became gradually more embarrassing. Uh, the CIA asked, uh, well, the U.S. asked the uh, quote-unquote Syrian rebels to differentiate themselves from Al Qaeda, and the whole all the rebel groups came out and said, "We are all Jabhat al-Nusra," and not only are they like allied to them, uh, they also uh, were doing the same exact actions. Uh, one of the CIA-backed rebel groups, Al Zinki, beheaded a 12-year-old boy on camera in Aleppo in in 2016. And uh, you can just guys look it up; like the video is online. And in the video, which I unfortunately had to watch, they said, "We are worse than ISIS." So um, it's obvious that the U.S. was fueling and funding Al Qaeda 
in Syria, and they still are, but they're doing it through their Turkish proxies, because Turkey at the end of the day is part of NATO, and Turkey is the biggest push behind this uh, Al-Qaeda group, um, which is the mm-hmm. now, now basically the main group in Syria. All the other groups have pledged allegiance and kind of dissolved the way. This is the major group that's left in Syria. Right. And they don't claim to be Al Qaeda, but they're basically Al Qaeda. I mean, they, they're essentially, maybe they're not linked to the group officially anymore because they're a breakaway, but it's Al Qaeda. I mean, that's what this is. Okay. Let's get back. Let's, let's roll the clock back and let's get to how this all started because, um, what the U S government has been claiming all of this time is that Assad is a dictator. He's a brutal dictator. He gasses his own people. And we have been on, and and we're supporting basically these this pro democracy movement that happened during the Arab Spring. So the Arab Spring happens, people are rising up. They want to get rid of the dictator, and we're going to help them do it. And that's been the narrative. But who were these people? Let's during the Arab St- Spring, uh, and maybe there was a legitimate uprising of people that didn't want to be ruled under Assad anymore. But maybe that got taken over by these you know Islamist rebels that are not pro-democracy at all. I mean, who were the, where, who was the uprising that happened back during that Arab Spring in Syria? Well, it started off as the Muslim Brotherhood, which was a banned organization in Syria for decades. The uprising was led by the Muslim Brotherhood. The U.S. knew that the uh, Syrian National Council, which was the de facto, like, uh, fake government that the U.S. set up to take over from Assad, which was located in Turkey, 80% of its members were Muslim Brotherhood members. So from the very beginning, that's what it was. Uh, It has nothing to do with democracy or freedom or human rights. So uh, it, but it very immediately had an element of sectarianism because from the very beginning, they were protesting uh, when they were coming out of the mosques, they were saying uh, about the minority groups in Syria, uh, Christians to Beirut and Alawis to uh, to the grave. Alawis being like a, a Shia sect in Syria. So essentially, um, this is the worst element of uh, the Syrian society that aren't representative of the majority of the Syrian people that the U.S. decided to arm. And if we can go back even before the Arab Spring, I mean, we can't claim that this hasn't been planned since the beginning. Because uh, the clean break policy document, uh, which was an Israeli, basically, a policy, uh, outlined their goals to begin with. So they, they wanted to destroy the Oslo Accords. Uh, they wanted the United States to overthrow Saddam Hussein. And in that document, they also said they need to follow up with the war in Syria and Lebanon and then Iran. So it's really, <laughs> it's just, a, you know, essentially, planned all along. So we don't really have to talk about whether it was legitimate or not, because we know this was a conspiracy. So what is Turkey's, uh, what is their motivation in this? Who who have they been backing and why? Well, from the beginning, they were backing the Muslim Brotherhood. And that is because Erdogan himself is, uh, his party is linked to the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, So he uh, also was part of the original operation that, uh, you know, the United States and Saudi Arabia, which also was involved in Operation Timber Sycamore to, to fund the rebels, quote unquote, um, they had a plan to get rid of uh, Bashar al-Assad, uh, weaken Iran's influence in the region, normalize with Israel, and get an oil pipeline through uh, Syria, basically under a new uh, regime. So that is the original plan. But slowly, people started to check out of this plan, um, specifically Saudi Arabia, you know, the new MBS uh, prince, he kind of felt like maybe these Muslim Brotherhood guys would actually be a threat to his monarchy. Because with the Muslim Brotherhood, they want uh, an election, essentially. They want to uh, have them select Erdogan or vote for him. Uh, and uh, so they're like Muslim Democrats in a sense. It's the worst of both worlds in in, in terms of what the monarchists uh, want. So MBS does not want uh, democracy in Saudi Arabia, and he realized that this could cause some blowback. 
And so there was some friction and tension between Turkey, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia and the UAE, if you remember. That, that doesn't mean that he didn't want to continue to normalize with Israel. He still did. Um, but he, he started to hesitate on, on backing this war in Syria. Um, and also, the United States put more of its resources into backing Kurdish groups in order to try to balkanize Syria in accordance with the Israeli Oded Yunon plan, which instructed uh, to basically take everything east of the Euphrates and give it to Kurdish groups because the Israelis intend to occupy everything west of the Euphrates in a greater Israel plan. Um, so that's what the US decided to go with. And actually that was the Pentagon and not the CIA that was driving that. Um, so Turkey was essentially left holding all the Syrian refugees and these terrorist groups, which they were afraid would blow back onto Turkey. Um, so Erdogan, he had a ceasefire agreement with Iran and Russia and Syria in 2018 in Astana. And this thing held for six years. But during that time, the Al-Qaeda forces were, were building up. Uh, the, Sir the sanctions on Syria were crippling. Uh, Syria's efforts to to build back up. Um, so it was a war of attrition that Syria was going through for six years, um, which culminated in this current uh, blitzkrieg on Aleppo. So the Astana agreement essentially failed because Erdogan backed, stabbed everybody in the back and went ahead with this uh, uh, force. And one of the reasons that I suspect he did this is because he wanted to get rid of these guys he just wanted to burn them so that they wouldn't blow back onto turkey um and he, he's essentially afraid of them more than anything where do the and kurds i'm talking about al-qaeda here this? yeah where do the kurds fit into all of this well the kurds you know uh what erdogan wanted from uh, assad was uh, uh, even a few months ago erdogan was asking to meet bashar al-assad in person in order to uh, have some sort of agreement. But Bashar said that there's no way I'm going to meet you unless you commit to pulling forces out of Syria. And that's non-negotiable. So obviously something between them during the negotiations bro broke down. And I suspect it also has to do with the Kurds. Because what, uh, what he wanted was to go and smash all the Kurdish groups. The Kurds, on the other hand, they have been overplaying their hand. Um, they have uh, been working with the United States and maintaining their occupation, which has also weakened the Syrian state because uh, all of Syria's oil fields, almost like 80% of them, all the wheat fields, they're all in the east of the country, which the U.S. occupies. So Syria couldn't fuel itself or feed itself for all of these years. Um, and the, the Kurdish groups have supported that. Uh, they have allowed that. And, uh, you know, in the east of the country, they are not even the majority of the, you know, they're not, they're a minority. They're not a majority. They're not an ethnic majority in the areas that they're trying to control, unlike what you're being told probably in the US media. Um, but now how they're going to fit in is that these forces are going to go in and they've already kind of taken over swaths of, uh, a Kurdish held territory. The question is, is Erdogan going to go east of the Euphrates? Now, he's already done that. He's already sort of done that with uh, Operation Euphrates Shield, which at the time when he called Trump uh, uh, to uh, let him know that Turkish forces are going to go in uh, to Kurdish held areas east of the Euphrates, Trump said, agreed to pull out of Syria because Erdogan told him, look, Turkish forces, which are NATO, May, ask, may unfortunately kill U.S. forces that they're embedded with the Kurds. And he's sort of facing the same scenario now. But it's even more complicated because Iraqi uh, PMU forces, the Popular Mobilization Forces, are also now coming into Syria from the Syrian-Iraqi border, moving up through al Qaim border crossing, which is kind of creating a cauldron where the United States uh, occupation forces are going to be surrounded from both sides, both armies like that are going to clash, and they're going to be in the middle. So the biggest, most important thing now is to try to push Trump to get the troops out. 
unfortunately, he's beholden to Sheldon, uh, to Miriam Adelson and uh, Jared Kushner and the APAC money, which want the United States to suicide itself for Israel. And that will involve uh, their forces in Syria and Iraq um, getting crushed. Uh, but that is what Israel wants, and what Israel wants, Israel gets in U.S. politics, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately. I mean, it seems right now that, for one, this is such a complicated, it, this is a compl complicated conflict where there's a lot of different parties at play with their own interests. And there's, I mean, I don't even know how many, you've got, you've got the Turks, you've got the Israelis, you've got the Iranians, the Russians, you have, um, you also have Hezbollah's in the mix there. And and you have uh, U.S. Obviously, the United States is there as well. And then, of course, there's Syria and their own interests. And then there's these Al Qaeda groups, right? The the rebels, the supp the supposed rebel groups. Um, so you've got so many different groups, and they all have. I mean, it doesn't seem like any of them have a uh, the same agenda as the other group. I mean, it's like seven different groups with seven different agendas. And sometimes the agendas align, and sometimes they're at odds with one another. And so this just ends up being this constant cycle of insanity that's going on in Syria. But it looks like the main player that benefits the most is Israel. Um, they're the they're the group Absolutely. that they win. I mean, this is they're ecstatic over this. This they're joyous over this. Now there's you know this is going to cut off weapons to Hezbollah, also to Hamas. Um, this is going to tie up more of the Hezbollah fighters. This is going to, you know, Russia's got its own thing going on in Ukraine, so they can't really necessarily rush in to help Syria right now. Um, Iran's got its own issues as well. So everybody seems really tied up with their own problems. And this was just a really great opportunity for Israel to, um, you know, whether they were involved in this or not in some way. I mean, there's, in my mind, I always look at whenever there's any conflict, I always look at who benefits the most and or has the greatest need or desire to benefit from something. And that is likely who maybe is pulling the strings behind the scenes. What do you think about that? Do you think that Israel is just lucky? They just got lucky. And Al these Al Qaeda fighters just saw that everybody was tied up and now's the time we're going to take advantage of this. And it was just their own strategic genius. Or do you think that Israel was actually somehow involved in this because Israel is certainly the biggest benefactor of this? Well, I think you took the words out of my mouth. This whole thing is not a coincidence that it happened just when the ceasefire was declared in Lebanon. And during the ceasefire, Hezbollah aimed to uh, regroup and rearm. And who is the group that provides the armaments for Hezbollah? It's Syria. They get their guns from the factories which are in Aleppo. So, uh, the, you know, all of the missile factories and whatnot have now been overrun by Al Qaeda terrorists who hate Hezbollah way, way, way more than they do Israel if they hate Israel at all. Because in fact, Israel has uh, been giving medical treatment. So during the war, the Al Qaeda terrorists actually moved all the way down to the Golan Heights border. And uh, they were being given medical treatment by Israel and arms uh, as well. So Netanyahu even visited some of these fighters in the hospital. Um, so the ex-Mossad chief went on Al Jazeera and he was interrogated about this um, by uh, Mehdi Hassan, which is another story, but we, he did a good job in that interview. And the guys essentially said, well, <clears throat> you know, we're doing it for humanitarian reasons. And so he asked him, would you do this for Hezbollah? He goes, no, we have a different account with Hezbollah because Al Qaeda has never attacked Israel. And he's like, but they've attacked the United States. So I, I would uh, encourage you guys to read that, uh, listen to that video. Israel has is backing the rebels in Syria. And even uh, recently when uh, the head of uh, Hezbollah, Sayyid Nasrallah was killed, the rebels in Idlib put up a poster in Hebrew saying, thank you, Netanyahu. It's obvious that they're doing this now in order to help Israel to prevent Hezbollah from rearming so that the genocide in Gaza can continue. 
And Turkey, mm -hmm. even though Erdogan talks a big game that he's against Israel for his constituents so that he can get elected, at the end of the day, Israel, uh, Turkey still recognizes the state of Israel, they've normalized relations with them, and they're giving them fuel. He's only saying that because he doesn't want to revolt against him. Look at what they do, not what they say. Uh, Syria is kind of like a Mexican standoff. Everybody's got his gun pointed at everybody else. But I think if you really boil it down, as you said, to who benefits, this is a war between Israel and Syria. And Syria has yeah. its allies and Israel has its allies. Right, because, I mean, what does the United States care if, if Assad is a dictator? I mean, do we care about the Saudi royal family? They're dictators. That's a dictatorship. I mean, it's a monarchy. We don't care about democracy. This whole illusion of, well, it's about supporting democracy when we're doing business with plenty of monarchies around the world, um, or at least in the Middle East. So it, it, that that is just, an, that's a total, you know, it's, that's just made up. It's completely and totally made up. And quite frankly, I would imagine that the Syrian people would much rather, if they have to choose between Assad or Al-Qaeda, they would rather be under the rule of Assad. Uh, there is nothing democratic about what Al-Qaeda is planning on doing or what they are doing. I mean, I'm hearing reports from people that have family in some of these towns in Syria that the women are now being told they need to cover up. So people that are in uh, religious minorities are afraid that life is going to change drastically for them. They no longer will be living in a secular state, that they're going to be forced sort of like Taliban light. I mean, that's that's what this group rolling in is very similar to the Taliban in a lot of their viewpoints and and what they would like it's to. Way worse than the know, Taliban. You think it's worse? Why? How do you? How do you think how, they're worse? Yes. Because if you if you've seen, they have been beheading people in the streets. They beheaded the soldiers they captured. That they shot them. But they've also been rounding up. So basically, the army actually retreated from Aleppo. So not a lot of the soldiers were captured. So what they did decided to do then was to just round up all the males of fighting age and walk them through the desert and said these are the Syri this is the Syrian army and they're probably going to start executing them unfortunately um and it's just exactly like Israel did where they raided a hospital they took all the doctors and uh, patients and they dragged them out in their underwear and they said this is Hamas because they can't actually catch Hamas they're under the ground uh, so it's very similar tactics to Israel. I mean, at the at the very least, of the, the Taliban uh, is, a, is a little bit more of a rational actor than the crazies in Syria. You know, the Taliban is willing to work on itself uh, and make some deals with Russia and China, whereas these people are just insane and um, they're head choppers essentially. I just don't. What so? What is the U.S. going to do? I mean, what do you think? Um... That's the big question that's circulating in the mainstream news is who's the U.S. going to back at this point? I mean, now you've got these fighters who the U.S. finally did designate as a terrorist organization after arming them, supporting them. There's a lot of suspicion, at least in my mind, that Israel, I mean, this is just such a wonderful thing for Israel as far as um, their battle with Hamas and Hezbollah that it's hard to imagine they didn't have a role in it somehow, that this wasn't something that, you know, I'm sure that this Al-Qaeda group, I don't, I don't know if they're working directly on behalf of Israel. I'm sure they have their own agenda as well, just like all of the groups in Syria seem to have their own agendas. But in this particular case, their agenda aligns, and that is take over Syria, kick out Assad, ensure that weapons don't go further towards, um, that weapons don't continue to flow to Hezbollah or to Hamas from, from Iran or from wherever. So they've, they've got this alignment there. It's hard to imagine that Israel isn't somehow involved in it for that reason. But um, um, these, the, the, but the U.S., you know, so that's the big question is, how does the U.S. reconcile with, now that the, the, this is now designated as a terrorist group, and everybody now knows that this group is basically al-Qaeda. We also know that the idea is that, you know, the, the, the the known story is that Al Qaeda was the one who attacked the United States on 9/11. So that's what the U.S. is. That's what they're from the frame that they're working from, right? Is Al Qaeda attacked us? We went to war trying to hunt down Al Qaeda, um, but now you've got Israel saying, "But yeah, we like Al Qaeda now because Al Qaeda is helping us stop Hezbollah and Hamas, and that and they're and and now Syria won't be a place for Iran. So we want that um, because, of course, Al Qaeda. This is a uh, a Sunni Muslim 
Islamist organization that is very much against the Shiites. They hate the Iranians. They hate the Shia Muslims, right? They're fully uh, against them. So that would make the hands of Syria would be against Iran, against Hezbollah, against uh, any of the Iranian agendas in the Middle East. And um, the question then is, what does the U.S. do? Who do they bomb? What do you foresee the Everyone. U.S. doing? <laughs> well, <laughs> they, they asked me the same question in 2014, and my answer was they, they're just going to bomb everybody um, because uh, they can. Uh, the thing, okay, but more more specifically, I think that uh, they have a plan. They want to turn, they want to cut, carve out a state let east of the Euphrates River, um, and they want to destroy uh, Iran and Syria, and they want to overthrow the Syrian government. They recently stated the State Department has recently stated that they will, uh, they want to overthrow the Syrian government. Um, so they are, they've essentially. Um, De redeclared what their intentions are uh, from the State Department document. It's going to be tricky for them because their Kurdish allies are going to be slaughtered by Al Qaeda, and uh, and their Tur by their t which are backed by their Turkish allies. So I think that they're going to allow that to happen anywhere that it's west of the Euphrates River, but they're going to try to draw a line east of the Euphrates River. I don't know if that's going to work out for them, but I think that's what they're going to attempt to do. Now, what's a complication for them is the Iraqi, as I said, popular mobilization forces, which they iron ironically worked with because supposedly the Iraqi government is their ally um, when they were fighting ISIS. But th they also killed the leader of the PMU and they've been bombing the PMU and in the past. So now that, that force is going to complicate matters and they're going to decide again are they going to side with the iraqis or are they going to side with al-qaeda and in that case i think they're going to side with al-qaeda because uh that is what would benefit israel the most because at the end of the day this is about destroying the resistance axis and it's about crushing any resistance towards israel uh by the uh you know by iran syria lebanon Yemen and the Palestinians. This is at the end of the day, that is the objective. So really they will go with whatever that is. The, I can't wait to hear the press conferences, you know, that the US is gonna hold um, answering these questions of, so who are we backing? And the US State Department having to say, Al Qaeda? <laughs> uh, <laughs> They'll say, then, well, well, why, we why would we be backing Al Qaeda? They'll say, oh, well, we, should, we just think Assad should leave. It doesn't matter if Al-Qaeda takes over. I, I think right, I mean, they'll just stick with that line. Right, but I would say the that the Syrian of... government... Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Go, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say, I do think that this is the opportune moment for the Syrian government to invite the US to leave and give them a timeline. Because, you know, the, the heat's already going to be turned up. It may as well turn it up a little bit more. Yeah, but, but you're I, I right. See, it's going to be an interesting press conference. Yeah, I don't see the U.S. leaving because I don't see Israel would would scream and say, "What are you doing? We need you there. We need you there to um, back the Al Qaeda rebel fighters and make sure that Assad doesn't grow in power again." Because that is what's helping us fight our war against Hezbollah and Hamas and Iran. And you want to stop Iran because you say. To everybody in the media that iran is actually the biggest state sponsor of terrorism and that they're the evil you know the axis of evil and so iran would be worse than al-qaeda according to the narrative and that's an interesting narrative that i am interested to see them try to try to convince the american public of when we've never been attacked by iran but we've certainly been attacked fact, by al-qaeda They've not, it's not even a hidden narrative. Like the Israeli uh, Ministry of Defense came out and said, we prefer ISIS to win in Syria over Iran. I mean, it's just open. This was back when ISIS was bombing uh, civilians all over the world, including the UK and the United States. But Israel came out and said, we prefer ISIS. And it's not, it's not uh, you know, it sounds like it should be counterintuitive, 
But at the end of the day, Israel is the Jewish version of ISIS. They are right. jihadis. They are uh, creating a religious I've never state. Heard that term, but that's a good one. Jihadis. <laughs> yes, yes, I've just coined the term. Wow. Essentially, they're okay. driven by a zealotry, a religious zealotry, right. where they think that they can take over Al Aqsa Mosque and the Messiah will come and it will be lead to the end of the world. And you know, we want Messiah and we have to ethnically cleanse anyone who doesn't agree with our religion. Like, and who does that sound like? ISIS. ISIS wanted to ethnically yeah. cleanse everyone who isn't their religion in Syria. And they also wanted the apocalypse. They had this apocalyptic doctrine that if they take over Damascus, then Jesus will return and it'll be the end of the world. So we're dealing with a kind of a similar beast. I think that if Israel kind of saw ISIS and Al Qaeda as something that would legitimize it, because they, they always mm -hmm. say like, look, look at all these Muslim countries around, but there's only one Jewish country right here. Well, actually, those countries aren't Muslim countries. They have their own ethnic groups. They ha their, Syria has its own history, its own culture. So does Palestine. Um, it, it's got a, a very long history that goes way back further than the Bible. Um, so uh, it, they were the first Neolithic farmers. It's, the, it's like the birthplace of civilization and language. But for Israel, it's just Muslim and Jews, and we have let them have their Islamic state so we can have our Jewish state. And uh, that's why they see Al Qaeda and ISIS as natural allies in the region. And that's yeah. why there's a, I'll, I'll send it to you a picture of Al Qaeda and the IDF hanging out on the Golan Heights border, just hanging out. Unbelievable. Well, it's going to be an interesting next. Um uh i guess chapter in this in this current war that is widened you know as much as they're saying we're trying to stop the widening of the war well the war just keeps widening and widening and widening they're just calling it different little wars when in reality it's it's it really looks like one big war that is breaking out they're just trying to paint it like it's smaller wars you know smaller regional wars um but in reality it just seems like one big middle east war um i love that term i think it's Juhadi. world war three <laughs> it, well, it's, it's, it certainly seems to look like it's leading towards that. And we'll see what Russia does, um, how much Russia can even help in this. I know they've come out saying that they're still supporting Assad, but they've got their own problems right now. And they're they're occupied with with Ukraine. So, you know, the question yes. is, how much help can Russia actually be at this point? But they certainly don't want to see a spread of terrorism. That is something that they have tried to stop because they are right there on the border of all of that terrorism. So they have a reason for wanting to stop it for their own national security, uh, the spread of that type of ideology and those caliphates and whatnot. But um, it's going to be really interesting Syria to see what also, happens in these next few weeks. Sorry? Sorry, Syria is also their only access point to the Mediterranean Sea. Right, that's um, right. But I've, I'm that's glad right. you like my jihadi term. <laughs> I love that term, yep, because it really does distinguish. It's like, you know, with the, with, with the Islamists, right, there's the jihad, there's the real radical, you know, Islamist sections like Al Qaeda, Taliban, uh, but of course the vast majority of Muslims are not, are not uh, jihadists in that, I, you know, it depends on how you use that term, right? But they're not, they're not, they're not caliphate driven. I don't know if I can say that though about the majority of Jews, unfortunately. I do think that there is a, um, you know, that that has been taught and, and burned into the brains, it seems like, the majority of Jewish people do want to see their Zionist home. They they do want their caliphate essentially in the Middle East. Yes. So I don't know. I think that the majority of Muslims don't really have that idea, and it's a it's a very vocal, strong, obviously um, militarized minority of the Muslims, and they're very dangerous and extremely scary, and it's terrifying. But I don't know if. But but nonetheless, the term jihadi, and maybe we could get many Jews to rethink it when they realize, like, wait a minute, am I a jihadi? <laughs> I don't want to be. I want to be, <laughs> be. be. You know, I, I want to be a moderate. I don't want to be a radical. <laughs> right. I just right. I want to yeah. be a moderate Muslim, not a radical. Mo you know, it's kind of the same sort of maybe yeah. way of thinking. I don't know. Like maybe it would help. I maybe it would help agree. with some of the deprogramming because it does need to happen. That is for sure. Um, Absolutely. Syrian girl, and where it can wasn't always find this way. You? No, it wasn't always this oh, way. This is like a newer thing that has been, um, you know, infiltrated into their brains of the, the teaching ever since really the Zionist movement really took hold. And since it became a nation, you know, after World War II, then it really started to get in, 
ingrained in the brains. And so, um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I'm confident that the deprogramming can happen just like I think it can with Muslim groups and like it has with Christians that went through crusades throughout the, you know, throughout history and, and all of that. I mean, everybody, everybody chills out <laughs> at some point. <laughs> I'm confident of it, of the chilling out. At least I'm hoping, I'm hoping. Where can people find you? Um, please follow me if you can on Twitter, Partisan Girl, or YouTube, Syrian Girl Partisan, or Telegram, Syrian Girl Partisan. Thank you so much, Kim. Thank you. I have those links down below. Thank you so much for your wonderful insight into the into the latest of what is going on in Syria. Thank you. Absolutely my pleasure. Thanks a lot.